warm welcome from all of us. Welcome to Poems in Progress. Um, on the panel, my name is Ekta Kukchandani. I go by the pronouns she, her. We have with us Aparna Chivukula, Uruj, and Anukriti Sharma. Uh, I'm very excited for you to join us for this panel. And uh, something about poetry, I do feel that poetry is like a crumb of a cookie and maybe prose is more like the packet of the the packet of the cookie box or the whole cookie box and i'm very fascinated by how much a crumb of cookie can give us versus a whole packet and as someone who also teaches creative writing i would like for us to start with an introductory question uh, please introduce yourself with the poem This is an old poem called From the Balcony. Living alone at home, I have been getting to know my neighbors. A bald man, foot over knee, reading the paper. A green hoodie running laps on a terrace. Dog, curly tailed, pacing up and down stairs. A woman launching clothes over her head and onto the washing stone. Then silence. Another dripping whack of a petticoat. It carries on as I prepare tea, wipe down counters, settle a payment. The thick thwack of nighties and pants. As morning light smokes through the neighborhood another day, I sit on the balcony and look out. No one awake yet, but I scan terraces and rooftops, looking for a smooth, long-dried stone, like a baby stretching out arms in a marketplace full, filled with strangers. Hi, um, oh. that was Aparna for us. Um, hi, my name is Uruj and I am a writer and um, my pronouns are they, them. So <coughs> I am going to read a poem called Chamkan Lagi Bindia, A History. Chamkan Lagi Bindia, A History. Intro. Sideshwari Devi's voice, like smoke, rising. You say there is a song that makes you feel you are stuck in the wrong body, in the wrong year, in the wrong century. Chamkan Lagi Bindia. A song that makes you want to be a curve, a swirling line, draped in a sari, dotted with a bindi, swaying your hips as you walk down the lane. Lagi More Bindia. You tell me this on the phone, humming its tune, sounding out the words, trying to imitate the tumak of the tabla to catch her voice in your own. Chamakan Lagi. Every queer life a reimagining. Chamkan Lagi More Bindia. The past and the body collapsing on each other without any absolutes, and your mouth moving, dark red stained with song as you plant yourself somewhere else in time. A feminized thing, a flowing thing, a thing with no name. No question of penis or vagina, no gaze to deconstruct, no family to disappoint, just you. Drawing my gaze wherever you go, historical and endless, your pallu trembling in the breeze. Namaskar. My name is Anukriti Upadhyay. I write fiction and poetry uh, in two languages, English and Hindi. A lot of my fiction is, has been published um, by HarperCollins. Um, a new short story collection is out um, earlier this year and is out there, the, the, the Blue Woman. However, I always regard myself as a poet first. Um, I write poetry in Hindi. I don't know how many of you have facility um, in the language, would you mind like, raising your hands if you understand? Um, not that I can do anything about it, but I would try my best to, <laughs> to uh, translate or give you the gist because poetry is as much about communication as it's about expression. So I hope my expression um, reaches you. 
Also, um, I've had a minor issue because I did not print my poems and I accidentally deleted the poem I was supposed to read. So here is another one. Uh, but uh, you know, thankfully I write prolifically. So here are, here is one. This is um, a theme that has always stuck with me. Um, men writing about women, men writing about young girls, men writing about women's um, bodies, their wishes, and their actions. Uh, the title of the poem is Ladkiyan. Ladkiyan nahi bhaagti ladkoon ke saath. Ve bhaagti hai daro diwaar ke atya charon se. Chot, kachot, jhapat, dapat, maar, pachhaad, rok, tok, fatkaaron se. Ladkiyan kabhi nahi bhaagti ladkoon ke saath. कुछ खुली हवा और थोड़ी सी मिठास की आस में भागती हैं लड़कियां। इस विश्वास में कि उनकी दौड़ की मोहक थिरक से मंत्रमुग्ध क्षितिज उन तक खिंचा आएगा, कि पहाड़ उनकी छलांग से सिकुड़ेंगे और समुद्र उनके अपांग से मधुरेंगे। अपांग means glance। लड़कों के साथ नहीं भागती हैं लड़कियां, वे सपनों के साथ भाग That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I also love the change of the poem. I feel like uh, that did so much justice uh, to your voice. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'll read a piece uh, called Another Love Affair. I'm currently dating English and our love is one of a kind. My tongue rolls at the word blue. Imagine how much love our tongues would make when I mouth words like silly, belly, soft nibbles, buttons, buttocks, faster, flabbergaster, collarbones, flamingo flowers, and dark chocolate dimples. English tastes like eggs benedict with hash browns and sun-dried tomatoes garnished with cheese on a lazy Sunday. Sounds like jazz music at a distance. I find myself swimming slowly. We've passed the tangy tangerine moments. We don't talk in semicolons and exaggerated ellipses. But when we discover another sweet spot, we are like an organic jaggery crepe. Our orgasms are beyond a series of exclamations. I have learned how to breathe into a comma to exhale to a full stop, shape into a question mark only to be spooned in with more flirtatious words. We've got this all mapped out, but this body of English surprises me with a new tickling spot, another mole on the left side of my inner thigh, a gray strand of hair. English looks so beautiful every day, cooks up words for me frequently as if we can have a platter of synonyms for all our emotions. But there are no synonyms, just similar words. I wish they'd understand that the sizzle of mustard seeds in ghee with curry leaves can never equate to rai or kadi patte ka tadka. See, I can articulate well in English, but I get drunk on Hindi. Ajeeb dasta hai ye, but Sometimes, Billy is cuter than cat. And this is just about that. No, not really, but how could I not be head over heels about Gulzar and Prateek Kuhar? Even chai tastes better than tea. Oh, oh, Jane Jana was once my go-to bathroom song. Okay, don't hold this against me. What I'm saying is that I want a love that Kundera writes about that Ali Smith boasts about, but also the one, but also the one from Lutera and Masan. I think love sounds wholesome in Bengali and tastes more like itself in Puranpodi and Basundi. I know that English is my lover, but that doesn't stop me from having these multilingual affairs. What if I'm a flower? Do I belong to the botanical family? What if I turn to a fruit? Am I the savior for the hungry? 
this geographical history cannot equate to the reality of my present tense. So to everyone asking where I come from, how do you not wonder where all I am going to go? <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, so everyone here on the panel writes in multiple languages and different genres. So I would like to ask everyone here that when the creative landscape is so fertile, be it fiction, flash, micro, non-fiction, what makes you return to poetry? Anukriti, would you like to <laughs> share some thoughts on that? Yeah. We are all, uh, you know, we are all extremely polite. We don't speak unless we are spoken to. <laughs> so, um, what what poetry helps me do, or what I um, do through poetry? Um, why do I believe that I'm primarily a poet who also happens to write fiction? Is because poetry embodies freedom. You know, poetry is boundless. You can say the unsayable in poetry. I, every day I start my writing. Um, with a few lines of poetry, a whole poem, a part, a couplet, a haiku, anything. It is almost like, you know, as if it's a catalyst, as if it just sets off a chemical reaction and the neural networks are firing in a way that they were not before I wrote um, the poem. So to me, poetry means, um, a mysterious force that I experience and then express, and it sets something free. And it helps me um, you know, say the unsayable. Um, just to add to that, is it different from writing prose? Um, it is, it is. Prose, um, uh, at least the way I write, uh, fiction, whether it's short or long form, it requires a map. It's not an exact map. And a lot of times, if not all the time, we are making it as we go. However, the map is there, a faint outline, uh, if not a bright line one. With poetry, I, I believe poetry is leading. It leads you and, and prose or fiction has to be led. It's, I guess, two different That's processes. That's wonderful. So much to learn here. Roj, would you like to go next? Yes, <laughs> OK. Um, so I mean, we've been discussing this since yesterday. And we had our fair share of laughs about you know what's the right definition. Um, but I think what Anukriti was saying about poetry leading you, that's something that I've resonated with in the sense that um, with a short story or an essay or any of those kinds of forms, there's a sense that you know where you're going. But with a poem, sometimes you will have just a phrase, like, and that's like a little light, but it's not showing you the way. You have to f follow it, and maybe it will be followed like right now, or maybe it will be followed in a year. Like sometimes I've had, um, you know, like, Things will strike me in a particular moment, but take shape much later. So I think that, in a sense, it is very different from like a story or a, an essay, or et cetera, because I feel like poems don't really have plans. Of course, you have to work on them, but only when they're ready for you. <laughs> so that's all. Thank you. Go for it. I, I don't have much to add, um, but I would say that Poetry, it doesn't demand complete sentences from me, and it uh, there's a lot of space for like a fragment or for just a moment, and uh, so for the, in that way, it's a more immediate form for me. Whereas prose might be something that I have to that requires hindsight or requires some time to pass before I'm able to put something down that's 
uh, concrete in that way. But uh, poetry is able to be more ambiguous and I think uh, hold more fragmented bits of writing. And um, yeah. I think I'll piggyback on that. And I also feel that for me, poetry is the distillation of words. So how much can I capture in that, in that one line? How much more can I say by just using a few words is something that I keep going back to. And I also feel that when I read a piece and I revisit it, that piece has changed for me and I've gotten multiple meanings. So in a way it opens up different universes in my head. So I feel poetry as a form is more imaginative and also more forgiving. It gives the reader space. Um, I think about food a lot. So I do think that poetry invites you to feast, but it does not tell you what to eat. And that is something that I enjoy a lot. Thank you. Uh, so it's really an honor to be celebrating poetry in person and also at a festival like this thinking about being in person and tapping into the nowness, what are you all currently working on? Or what have you currently, recently worked on in the past? <laughs> this, uh, it's, we were discussing this yesterday and they were like, oh, the teacher is gonna lead us, so I'm gonna take names now. <laughs> uh, Aparna, would you like to share yeah. something? Yeah, I'll read something that's a work in progress. It's called singing. In my parents' room, from the bathroom duct, every day we could hear two little girls singing prayers as someone gave them a bath. Sanskrit sing song garbled by hair pulling and mug splashing and feet stomping tiles. My mother kept her bathroom door open for this music. She sometimes commented about the marvel of two muddu pillalu addressing God. Once or twice each day, I would try to spend time with her, bringing out the carom board or mention a line from a poem. She always looked so tired, her nighty always drooping off her bent shoulders. In the nights after everyone slept, I drew bath water so hot, it was like a hug that stayed in me the whole night. In the bucket, I once caught a glimpse of my eyebrows slant, silently mouthing to myself some heartbreak song and stopped. I felt so ashamed. Aparna, can you also share what inspired you to write this piece? Um, I have exactly what it says. <laughs> so I just, yeah. Observation? Yeah, just feeling and, yeah. Okay. Uruj, would you like to go next? Um, so what I'm working on recently, uh, I will show you because I don't have a book. So I made like a little booklet of, you know, a few poems or whatever. Not, it's not for sale. It's just for me. Um, but if anyone wants to take a look, uh, later, I will share, um, a poem I'm quite happy with, um, what I've been trying to do recently because I recently started looking after cats, fostering them, etc. Um, after being scared of them almost all my life. Um, I'm doing a series of cat poems, um, trying to write about each cat, whatever. So this poem <laughs> is called um, Yowling Notes. <coughs> Yowling Notes. Each time Max approaches my rupees 800 only cane bookshelf bought on the roadside, I know what he's really doing even if there is a bit of cane caught between paw and tooth. Max has been eating poems. He tries very hard to repeat them through the night, letting his wavering notes bounce off the green walls in the flat, asking to be heard. He's loud enough to wake me, and if I tune my ear correctly, if I listen right by the door, I can hear the metaphors, garbled but genuine. I can even count his protracted syllables. The weight of poems is such that Max has to spend the afternoons fighting sleep, stretching his legs until his claws come out, his eyes warm with verses he must remember. I know what he's really doing when he climbs onto my chest one night and looks right at me, as if the quiet will not do, as if he requires an audience, as if the poem is only alive if it is shared. 
Max has been eating poems. That's why his food is always left over, a perpetual late lunch he often loses interest in. His canines glimmer with simile, his whiskers longer with enjambment. Restlessly pacing on his tiptoes, his fur expanding as his tail quivers, calling out a section of Whitman, then whittling out some fares. He confuses Keats with Mehrotra, mixes Dickinson with Akhat Mova. He pauses over Plath before he stumbles into Sappho, wrestling with himself until the only way out is staring at another piece of cane. I know what he's really doing. I have looked into his eyes. Even if he's only been here for two and a half days, a new kind of friend, folding himself like a page that is sailed under the bookshelf at random. Another bit of cane between his teeth, his eyes wary and almost fugitive, an imprecise thief, heaving and heaving until he's spinning out by the door. Max has been eating poems. So I'm actually taking off from a line from Aparna's poem, Drooping Shoulders, the night of droop falling over her drooping shoulders. Uh, one of the abiding themes in my poetry is um, women and women's condition. Um, this, this poem is titled, Striya Bas Striyo Jaisi Hai. And with due um, apologies to uh, Mr. Vinod Kumar Shukla. Vinod Kumar Shukla is a very famous uh, and a very unique um, Hindi author. And if you haven't read his work, you know, I cannot recommend them, them enough. His style, his choice of subjects, the way he puts them together, he writes fiction as well as poetry, is very, very unique. He's also available in um, English translation. The, the uh, title of this poem is a take on a, a line from his uh, short story, which is Nila Ran, Nile Ran Jaisa Hai. Blue is like blue. And that's also the title of the translated collection of poetry published by my publisher, Harper Collins. स्त्रियां बस स्त्रियों जैसी हैं, जैसे धूप घाम या तुम अपने जैसे हो, वे लताएं घटाएं बारिश या धनक, नदियां चिड़ियां जुनहाई या चमक, कांच कुंदन चंदन धरती हवाओं वगैरह जैसी नहीं हैं, स्त्रियां स्त्रियां हैं, वे माएं प्रेमिकाएं या बेटियां, गणिका शनिका या देवियां नहीं हैं। वे सिर्फ तुमसे मिलने घरों से नहीं निकलती हैं, वे सिर्फ तुम्हें देखकर नहीं मुस्कराती हैं। उनके ख्यालों में शायद तुम्हारी उतनी जगह है नहीं जितनी तुम सोचते हो। वे एक बड़ा और बहुरंगी संसार चाहती हैं, जिसमें तुम हो, लेकिन तुम में उनका संसार नहीं है। स्त्रियां सिर्फ स्त्रियों � वे जब तुम्हारे साथ घरों से निकलती हैं, तो तुम्हारे लिए नहीं, खुद मुख्तारी के लिए निकलती हैं। वे उबाऊ पतियों और लंपट प्रेमियों के प्रति तुम्हारी ही तरह बेवफा हो सकती हैं। उनका प्रेम और पछतावा सच्चा हो सकता है और झूठा भी। वे उतनी ही गैर मामूली और अनूठी हैं, जितने तुम। वे और आखिर आखिर मनुष्य हो सके तो मनुष्य रूप में जानो क्योंकि स्त्रियां सिर्फ स्त्रियों जैसी हैं। That was so gorgeous. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I'll be reading a piece called Sunspotting. For me, I keep returning to water, no matter which city or country I'm in. So, Sunspotting. It's the sound of waves I keep returning to. It's the sound of waves breaking in a blue scallop seashell by the sea. I wonder about wondering, does it go anywhere? I draw flowers on my arms and thighs, ready to go to the beach. I am a walking, talking bouquet or a wildflower. I could grow into anyone, but I keep revisiting grocery stores. If I plug a rolled paper to my ear, I hear the harrowing wind like a falsetto that doesn't end. 
What is a finless fish? A paper boat without a puddle? A shell free snail? A seahorse swims upwards to avoid predators. I've taken the hobby of catching the sun from between branches with lesser leaves while driving. I keep driving, following the sun, and it's everywhere but here with me. The sunset etched at the back of my head. I wake up and I find the sun in the belly of my potted plant. And just like that, I am back to watering. It is the sound of water I keep returning to. I scoop words out of words, dead from jaded, daunt from haunted, and sob from sober, and meanings out of nothing. I want to grow a flower with a mole and name it after the North Star or a pea pod, something to remember it by. And the swallows drink water by the river, carry its sound, and sing it into the sky. I should sing in the bathroom like my voice is made of ice blue sky. I had a dream of kissing a goldfish underwater. It broke when the seahorse swam upwards. To hear the water underwater is a new kind of listening. I wonder about drowning. And where does it go? So all of us here have been working on a manuscript and I would like to ask everyone what is the most exciting part of working on the manuscript and probably also the toughest. I think for me, uh, putting together a set of poems is also the chance to put away the set, which is exciting because it means uh, new work can happen and there's an end in sight. Um, and it's been it's been like rearranging. Uh, it's oh okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's almost like uh, if you're moving house and um, you start registering the objects in your house differently. Things that you might have passed by on a daily basis, you suddenly they look different, and then you have to arrange them into boxes in a new fashion. So it's it's almost been like that to put together a set. So that's been exciting. Um, yeah. Toughest part? I don't know. I don't, it's, it's the toughest and most exciting part, yeah. Um, I don't know how many people are interested in knowing our treasured insights, but we have the mic, so. <laughs> um, I think the fun, um, fun, yeah, uh, of putting your work together is that I've been able to figure like themes like, oh, I'm a little obsessed with cats or that, you know, um, I, uh, I've realized that a lot of my writing is about different places, places of food. Um, and that's been interesting because I'm based in Delhi and there's a lot of interesting food cultures in Delhi. Um, and I sort of was, I'm starting to do like a little bit of writing about uh, immigrant food culture. So for example, one very interesting um, piece I think that I'm working on um, is a poem about a Syrian restaurant that I was recommended about three years ago. And what's interesting is that in the last three years, they have changed their name thrice. So, and the, write, like the process of writing is not just that I was happy with the food, but also I was very curious that why are they changing their name every year? Every year I would be scared that it's shut, I won't get my food, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that um, th through discussions with people there and people who visit, um, I was able to gauge that there's a lot of Islamophobia that's actually happening and the restaurant keeps getting review bombed because people are not happy with the fact that they serve meat or that they have mosques, like just print out photos and Arabic in their menu. So it's very interesting to kind of, I don't know, this is a tangent, but interesting to see um, that of course food is interesting, but there is also so much of an undercurrent of like politics and like who is making it, who is eating it, why, the, why I mean, why are things reviewed in particular ways? Um, 
So yeah, I think that's been very interesting for me, um, looking at these kinds of themes of, you know, yeah. That, that's Would you also <laughs> like to share the name of the restaurant? What were the names? Sh sure. <laughs> Um, first time they went with something very simple. They were like the Syrian restaurant. Then, <laughs> then the next year I was trying to find them and then I saw a board and the name was Not, N-O-T, that's it. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then this year again I was passing by and I was like waiting to see and now their name is Sultan Al Arab. So let's see what happens next year. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, so I resonate with Uruj there that um, you identify themes in your own works. You see uh, what is your obsession. For example, I found I have 20 poems on moon. I'm clearly obsessed. They are all in meter. They are all different, and they all have very different um, thoughts and images of moon. So um, also, uh, you know, I. I see how I have moved over time because I've been writing poetry for a very, very long time. Um, I see how my um, expression or my usage has changed and how many poems I can discard and never look at again. Um, so uh, to me, it's the process of, um, it, almost a process of discovering where my poetic voice is headed you know, for, for me also, it's interesting to see um, how, how it's developed interiority, how it views ex the external, how it's impacted by seasons. Um, so it's like a housekeeping exercise, a bit like a parnaya housekeeping. Uh, I think for me, I love to, like once we have the index, I can understand the hierarchy so which, which piece am I going to give more power and start my book with that versus which piece is going to be the title poem and what follows after. So um, I think what I've realized is that while writing and curating or revision or whatever we'd like to call that is what power I'm giving which voice. Am I starting a piece in a woman's voice or am I starting it in first person narrative? And that does illustrate what the reader might carry through going going forward with the book. Um, so that is something that has been, that's something on my mind while working on my book. And um, I'd actually like to, like for us to share a short piece. Each of us, we, ha we have close to four to five minutes now. So would love for us to share one short piece, all of us. Um, Aparna, would you like to start? Sure. This is called Early Chicago Days. After kindergarten, my father would walk me home talking to the air about numbers and profit margins with a tech beetle in his ear. The other kids could think him crazy, so I mouthed words in his direction, nodding, my baby mittens trying elaborate gestures. It was all for strangers passing by, our invisible two-person play me whispering the English I'd learned that day, and Mr. Murthy insisting to the air, it's all right, sir, you can call me Murphy. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna share a small piece. Um, it's called AC is very intense. <laughs> it's called uh, Things Are Not, it, it's fine, it's fine, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's called Things Are Not To Scale In A Pandemic. Today, time is tinier than the tiniest tooth in your tiny cousin's mouth who is telling of time clearer than the clock. Her tiny hands grow every week and her tiny hair thicken overhead and her tiny fingers tighten over the pen and her tiny feet tire at the stairs. When the picture is taken, you two are sat together and time is as tiny as the talk coming out of her tiny teething mouth as she turns to the camera. I love the tea sounds.
She's really tiny. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I'll read a poem that is more in meter because I write in, um, I in both rhythmic and free verse. So I thought maybe, you know, just to vary. The title is Maka Ghar. Subha Savere Baji Hai Ghanti Darwaze Par Ahat Kiski Gunjit Hai Swar Kutta Bhonka Chup Reh Nat Khat Maane Dapta Deer Raat Tak Jaagi Thi Ho Ab Soti Hai Nal Se Tapka Paani Tur Tur Galiya Ra Pairon Ki Sar Phar Khuli Rasoi Bartan Khatke Jharan Poonchan Chura Chatke Mata Ji Doodhya Gohar Kya Kalewa Mehri Boli Jhirka Maane Dheere Bolo Soti Hai Ho हवा झरोखे में भटकी है, धूप छाह में जाट की है, रात नवंबर का उगता है, नील गगन शरद पकता है, आधी जागी अधसोई हूँ, माँ का घर है अनसाई हूँ। I'll share this piece which is kind of about drinking or maybe not. My heart is an oak tree. My heart is an oak tree. It is big and branching. It must be a hundred years old. Oh, my heart is a wine barrel. I've had much to drink. There are flowers growing, facing the mud and soil. Blooming is a small, sad thing. Meanwhile, the bird song is more melodious. Then bad things happen alongside good things, like crying and breaking into laughter. Funny things happen too, like I ate lemon seeds after reading a poem, or I saw a squirrel nibble on an acorn and imitated it. I wonder about vegetables, how they soften when they are spoilt, and that we cook them on slow flame to soften them. These matters of the heart must be left to take their course. That is, if my heart is an oak tree, or I've just had much to drink. Um, with that, uh, this is the end of the panel. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being in the audience. And a big shout out to Lakshmi, Meena, Palgun, Sarita. And I have a long list, but I'm going to keep it short. Thank you, everyone, for being here.